Shalom. Once again, I am your friendly neighborhood brew, Bon Shemayim, back with another one. And today, we are going to be discussing marriage, right? As you can see from this, it says what God says about marriage, and then it has this quote, which we'll be going over. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let men not separate, right? So when two people lay together, they become one, right? They interact. It's not just that you become one and interact and pass spirits between each other. No, you become one flesh. And then there's an order to that. And I wanted to get into this because a lot of times, you know, you have men and women trying to use God or Christ to separate them from their responsibility. We have a responsibility to each other once we're committed. Like like the Bible said, let no man separate. Right. So we would be the men that separate in the marriage, the ones who didn't want it. We're going to start off in Mark 10, 11 through 12. It says, and he saith unto them, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery, right? So it's saying that the woman and the man aren't allowed to put each other away. Because it's a sin. You're, you're leaving each other open for adultery. Remember, that's why it was told in the Bible, let the husband and let the wife not separate. Let every woman have a husband and let every man have one have a wife, right? It was done to protect us, to honor the covenant in which God has put in place, right? This is a covenant between woman and man, husband and wife. A order that God put together from the beginning with Adam and Eve. We don't get a choice to abstain from God's order. Okay, so this is Mark 10, 8 through 9. Uh, once again, directly from the mouth of Yeshua or the mouth of Christ, our Savior, right? It says, and they twine shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twine, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, right? So it's saying that once you become one flesh, you're no more separate. You're no more twined. You can't think of it as you being separate, but you're one flesh. And let no man put asunder. That's talking about those people. Understand that outside sources can affect your marriage. It's the decision of the, the husband and the wife to put the marriage asunder like we just read in the previous. So it's saying that if the one man, when it's saying no man, remember we described that woe is just a female version of the man race, right? So if we're going to go into that, it's saying that no man or woman can put it asunder. Be don't put asunder what God put together, right? What God joined together, if you two came together, it, it was from God from the beginning. God ordained it from the beginning. So let no man break that apart. Okay, so the next one is John 4, 16. And this is when Yeshua was talking to the woman with the uh, five husbands, right? It says, Jesus saith unto her, go, call thy husband and come hither, right? Why did he do that? He told her to go get her husband and come hither because her husband is the head over her. There's an order. And even Christ respected the order. And that's why we're going through the words of Christ first, because we'll use Christ to disrespect the order. The man and say, well, listen, my woman, she not following in Christ. She don't believe the Bible the right way and want to separate because of it. Or a woman will say, well, listen, I want to be with Christ alone. I just need time to get myself together with Christ and God, which is against Christ. That's why he told this woman to go get her husband. We're going to get a little bit deeper now into this order. And we're going to go through 1 Corinthians 11, 4 through 5. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven, right? So shaven means to be scorned, right? Like when you have your, when you don't have hair, when your head's uncovered, it, it means you're ashamed or you're scorned, right? So it's showing right here that the woman had to have her head covered and the man had to have his uncovered because the man is the head of the woman. So the man need to have his head uncovered for the interaction with God. It is a shame for him to cover his head, right? And the woman had to have her head covered, right? Because her head is the man. 
That's why she had to have her head covered. Okay, so this next scripture is Ephesians, right? We're going to start at Ephesians 5 and uh, verse 13. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doeth manifest is light, right? So you want to manifest light. It says, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, rendering the time because the days are evil, redeeming the time. I'm sorry, redeeming the time because the days are evil, right? So you got to make the best of your time with the people you around. It says, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, right? So don't, it's not a will of our own. It's the will of the Lord. And be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks for all things unto God in the Father, in the name of our Lord, Yeshua Wamasiach. It says, submit yourselves to one another in the fear of God, right? See, we'll use God, like I was speaking of earlier, we'll use God to say that, listen, I need to get away from this woman because she evil. And I need to do what I need to do for God as a man. Like, this is what men say. And women will be like, well, I need to get closer to God. And it's just about me and God. It's not about you. But that's not the order. That's why the Bible says, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, remember, this isn't just speaking of marriages here. This is speaking of the body of Christ. All the people who are believers, we're supposed to submit ourselves to one another because we're afraid of God, right? It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord, right? So that's the position of wives. You have to Submit yourselves to your husband as unto the Lord. You can't use your, uh, the Lord as a reason not to submit to your husband. That goes against Christ's own order. You That makes you being the person, the man that or the one man that is uh, trying to take apart something that God put together. Right. It says for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything, right? So this is the role. Women are supposed to be under their husbands. It's not grievous. You, we can't use Christ as a separation tool to not want to be or uh, perform our role as Christ told us to, right? And husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to itself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and ch cherisheth it, even as the Lord of uh, even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and his bones. Once again, going into what I was saying from the beginning, right, that we are all one member. And once you become one, like a man lays with a woman and a woman lays with a man, you become one. And this is for the man. I know you want your wife to be blemishless, to be spotless, to understand the doctrine that you're trying to teach. But you can't use her not being as an excuse to not be with her. That, that That's not a valid excuse, right? It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for it. Remember, Christ loved the church, the people of God, which the church really got built after Christ's death. And if you remember what the disciples said, they, they were telling the church, you guys are responsible for the killing of Christ, right? So these people who Christ loved, the people of God, he gave himself. He died for them. He died for them. He loved them so much that he let them accuse him and break him. And he died for, for those people, right? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word.
that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Right. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Right. So even if she's not where you would like her to be, it's not an excuse. We cannot use Christ, rather you a man or a woman, Christ or the Bible to bring separation against each other unless it be for adultery. There's an order that a man must oversee. There's an order that a man must have. Right. According to the Bible and the man must keep that order and commit to it. So as a man, we need to get ourselves better with God. And like the Bible says, look at our wives as the weaker vessel. So understand they're not going to get everything. And sometimes Satan is going to tempt them a little bit more than he tempts you. And it's frustrating as a man because, you know, you're tempted. You know that you get tempted. Satan tells you all these type of things, but you fight your feelings. You fight your temptations. And it's no excuse for the women to not fight their temptations or their feelings. But this is just the way the cookie crumbles. We're going to continue with 31. It says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they shall, be, they shall be one flesh, as we read earlier, right? This is the great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, so love his wife even as his self. And wife, see that she reverence her husband, right? So see that you re reverence your husband. And the reason I went into this, because sometimes people use this to say, that means you need to leave your mom and your dad, right? But if you pay attention to what it's saying, it says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. You're not going to be in front of your mom or your dad uh, having sex with your wife and becoming one. That's not what happens. But if we read through the Bible, right, Isaac met his wife, Rebecca, in his mother's tent and they had sex and he stayed under Abraham, right, up until Abraham passed. He never separated. Now let's go to Jacob. Jacob had 12 children, right? Mostly sons. All of his sons stayed with them besides Joseph. And they were all married with multiple children, right? All of his sons stayed with them besides Joseph. So it wasn't that they had to leave eternally. No, in order to meet a wife or in order to lay with the wife, you're going to do it separately. So they left for a temporary time in order to join with their wife. And then they came back. So People cannot use this excuse to try to tear away a, a son from his mother or a son from his father or or a daughter from her uh, father or a daughter from her mother. Even though if we go through the Bible, most women left behind their fathers and mothers and went with their husbands. For example, Jacob's wives left their father, Laban, and went with Jacob. They followed Jacob all the way to where his parents was from, which was the land of Canaan at that time. And Jacob went back there for his mom and his dad. And he was there with them until they passed. Right now, this is Romans 12. We're going to start at one. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect in the perfect will of God. Right. So you can't we can't use these worldly things of breaking up and separating and all of these things the world has taught us to think that, oh, well, we're perfect in God. No, perfection in God would be to be the model husband or the model wife, according to the Bible. That would be perfection in God, along with all the other things. Of course, we can't sin. Of course, there's certain things we're uh, not supposed to eat. I mean, we're going to sin, but we're not supposed to. We should be repenting and all of these other things. Of course, those things are included. But understand, uh, uh, your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So if God expects you to serve your husband the way uh, your husband, he expects your husband to serve you or he expects you to care for your wife the way he cares for the church, that is your reasonable service as a husband or as a wife. 
right? And be not conformed to this world, right? Because this world will tell you, you don't have to do these services. This world will tell you, you need to have these expectations met in order for you to do these services. But the problem is once you've laid together and become one, you've already made that. You've already made that expectation for y'all to have those services towards each other. And it's too late to back away because what did he say? Let no man, you know, undo what God put together. For I say, though the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, right? So this is once again proof that soberly is not speaking of getting drunk. According as God have dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members of one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ. And every one members one of another, having the gifts deferring according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry. Let us wait on our ministry or he that teacheth on teaching. Right. And the reason I'm going into this is once again with the wife thing. We're part of one body. And this is beyond just the husband and wife. This is as a people. But remember, the Bible says until you get your household clean, until your household is in order, you can't go fix up every all the people. Right. That don't mean that you're not supposed to minister. It just means that you should be putting more detail into getting your household in order. Right. Because part of our job is to minister. Right. Remember, Peter left his wife to go minister the word of God. Right. And it says, uh. For as we have many members in one body, right, showing that we're one body, all members have not the same office. So it's important for people to understand you don't have the same office. Everybody don't have the same role. Women don't need to try to be like men in their relationships. In man, you can't take the role of the woman, right? And it's hard, right? It, it, it's not easy. This is Matthew, uh, this is Luke 12 and 49. It says, I am come to send fire on earth, right? Because the world will get this fire baptism on Christ's return, right? And what will I, if it be already kindled, right? It says, but I have baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth, right? So Christ didn't come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division from for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Notice the things it did not mention that he came to divide. The husband and the wife. It never mentions that he came to separate them because they are one. They are one flesh. That's why he didn't. It didn't mention separating the husband from the wife because that order is the order that is supposed to be. Right. He never mentioned it. He talks about division and how the division is supposed to take place, but he never mentioned that the vision that the division is supposed to separate the husband from the the wife. So man can't use Christ as a reason to separate from their wives because their wives don't believe or don't understand the way they should. And women can't use Christ as a way to separate from their husband, saying that I just want to be under Christ. I just want to learn from him, because as he told the woman with the five husbands, go get your husband. Right. So we can't choose to go against our our Christ's order and create our own order and expect Christ to just accept our order. No, we must fall in line with the order Christ put in place that he follows, that it was put in place from Christ and God from the beginning. Now, this is 54. And he said also to the people, when ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. And when ye see the south wind blow, ye say, there will be heat. And, co and it cometh to pass. Yet hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and the earth, 
For how is it that ye do not discern this time? Right? And this is one of the biggest problems. We allow the world to dictate our feelings. Right? And, and we go off of our feelings, men and women. And a man think, well, the woman ain't righteous enough. The woman think, well, I just want to be with Christ. I don't need a man. Right? Because this is what the world tells you. But while y'all are fighting each other, instead of keeping the order of God, how can you not discern the time that you live in? We live in the end times. So while we should have faith that Christ is going to be there for us and that he's our savior and he's going to rescue us, we have to make sure we're doing our duties in the order that Christ said it. We can't choose and pick what we want to do, right? We know the order of, of God in relationships and this night needs to be fixed before the end. Because the thing that they have an advantage of us, if you're watching the bombs drop in Lebanon and the bombs drop in Ukraine and in Russia, the thing that they have over us as a people in America is that they are together. They believe in the bond of God in a relationship. So when things go awry, they're going to be there for each other, to look out for each other. Right? Husband and wife. A uh, uh, family member, a uh, uh, neighborhood, right community, and we need to get these things together. But it starts at home. It starts with just the basic commitments that Christ was saying, and keeping in the the uh, relationship ordered, and loving each other to prove that we love Christ. It's it's a far cry to to believe that we can love Christ if we don't love the order and the things in which He wanted us to love. We can't choose and pick what about Christ we love. We have to love them all or love them not at all. We don't want to be those people at the end of time that Christ says, I never knew you because we weren't following his order and trying to do things his way because we decided we wanted to do it our own way. And Christ would not tell us. So it's not Christ talking to us. That's how we separate. Like when Christ was on, on the mountain battling with Satan, he used the word and the understanding of the word to separate what Satan was telling them from right and wrong. So if, if something is in our head or other people around us are telling us that we don't have to be committed into our marriages and we don't have to do this and we don't have to do that, understand that Satan, rather it be those people or Satan telling us eternally, because God would not want us to forfeit the order in which he put in place in order for our own selfish uh, uh, goals, because that's selfishness. That's not righteousness. Now, with that being said, I just want to say Thawada and thank you all for tuning in. I hope that this benefits women in understanding the, the role of the marriage that you have and the responsibilities that you have, as well as the man. I hope this allows, I hope men know the role and the responsibility that they have. And it's, it's not, you cannot create it to be such an easy thing to just do away with each other because that goes against God. And in these times that's coming up, you're going to need each other. It's going to be better to have somebody by your side than to be alone. And some will say, well, I have children. I have responsibilities. I have nieces. I have nephews. I have my mom. I have my dad. I have other responsibilities. I'm not going to be alone. Jacob had a bunch of children, a lot of children, right? He had quite a few wives, but he felt lonely when Leah left. He cried and wept and he lamented. He lamented for her. He was hurt because of it. So understand that we go in through a time that just because you have these things, they also have their own lives. They also have their own things. But the person who you were created to be a partner with, who God allowed you to become one with, or else God would not have ordained you two to lay together. He allowed you two to lay together and become one. You cannot break that apart based off of uh, whatever beliefs you want. I mean, you can, but that's against God. We all have the choice to go against God, but we can't choose to go against God and believe we're on God's side. We live at the end, and I hope everybody could get together, marriages and friendships and neighborhoods, neighborhoods and communities, right? But it starts eternally. It starts with us making a better decision to work it out between our husbands and our wives and strengthen that up. And then we build our neighborhood and we build not saying you can't build them while you're on the rocks or having situations in your marriage. You still want to continue to do the work of the most high God. Just be weary that you we need to get these things in order before the end come. So no more people. We need to stop making selfish decisions for ourselves and saying that it's for God.
because God, we can't go against God and say that God wants us to do it. On that note, I just want to say Shalom, Barakatha. I love y'all. I hope this helped a lot of people, men and women, with your marriages and your relationships and help you become better and closer with God, especially in these end times when we're going to need it. And until the next time, sorry I made the video so long. On that note, peace out.